Welcome, everybody. Now we will discuss and talk about something that unites everyone around the world, and that is food and, and the concept of eating. Right now, we are in the country and the city in the world with the most Michelin stars per capita. It's a, it's a country that is famous for its food. And the Arctic region is also famous for its food. It's where we, where we build our economies. 95% of exporting Greenland is from seafood. Uh, Iceland has been very strong on full utilization. The indigenous communities are reindeer herders while also living from whaling and so on. So food is something that unites us all, both the Arctic region, the world, and Asia. Today's panel is a little bit different from what everything else you have seen the last few days. This panel is strongly inspired by Selena Gomez, uh, that during COVID times in 2020 decided to make some videos with chefs where she will have a conversation. So Selena Gomez on one side and a group of chefs on the other side, and they will cook together. So what you will have uh, on the video screens here are some uh, edited versions of some videos where chefs are cooking with Norwegian products um, and having a conversation about food. I just quickly want to introduce the panel because I think it's quite a diverse and an interesting panel. So if we start from one end, we have uh, Johan here, who is the director of the Norwegian Seafood Council, uh, covering both Japan and Korea. He has a master in fisheries from University of Tromsø, so a background from, uh, from the Arctic region and fisheries, and also an understanding of, of both Japan and Korea that we will talk more about. Then we have uh, Chef Saori here, who uh, is a Japanese born, but uh, has been working uh, with, uh, in, in Stockholm since 2014, and has kind of combined both the Nordic cuisine and the, the Japanese cuisine as well. And it's just a perfect example of, of bringing some of Japan to, to the north and also bringing some of the north into Japan. We also have another chef. So the two chefs are in the middle. We have Chef Peer, who is director of a uh, Northern Norwegian Competence Food Center. So kind of trying to, to teach and spread the gospel of Northern, Northern food. He's also from the Arctic region. And I'm very happy he's here as well. And you will see him later in a video. Then we have Jens Olvay, who uh, studied political science, uh, was a background uh, from the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University, later got into logistics and started importing cars and exporting cars uh, with Japan. But now he's importing seafood and has a lot of experience from the seafood industry and lives here in, in Japan. And last but not least, a man who probably doesn't need much introduction because we have seen him already. But I think it's important to remember about Dr. Hide Sakaguchi from the Sasakaba Foundation, that he also has a background in agricultural engineering. So agriculture engineering is really about science, it's about food, it's about everything the society needs. But without further ado, I want to jump straight into it. So what we will have is we will have very short introductions to the seafood you will hear about. Then we will have a three minutes video, and then we will have a short conversation about that video. And to give us the first introduction about the first seafood, um, Johan will just introduce very briefly the role and importance of mackerel. So could you just give us the 30 seconds brief to, to mackerel, and then we'll put on the video. Thank you. The 30 second brief for the mackerel. Well, to, let, to be honest, mackerel in, Norwegian mackerel in Japan is extremely popular. Actually, one out of two mackerel caught in Norway is exported directly or indirectly to Japan. So Japan is by far the most important market for Norwegian mackerel. And two thirds of it is exported via third countries for processing, and one third, 50,000 tons, is exported directly to Japan. And Japan and Korea, they love our Norwegian mackerel, and just one main reason, it's the fat. It's the fatty Norwegian mackerel that gives a unique flavor that everyone loves. So with that, I think. Every chef would know. So let's yeah. put on the first video. The first video, thank you. And lean back and enjoy this. Okay, yeah. uh, my name is uh, Hide Sakaguchi. I'm Robert. I represent a Norwegian company called Wild. That's the one. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> so, Wild means basically wild. The Norwegian mackerel is wild caught. Mm. It's born in the sea, mm. it's growing in the sea, mm. and we catch it in the mm. sea. And the fish that you currently have 
uh, at your kitchen, Hirasan, is uh, produced during the fresh season uh, during fall last year. This is the, the fillet of the mackerel uh, we received. Yeah. It's, it's also clean. Is it a handmade operation or you use some special, special tool to make this uh, fillet? I'm glad you asked. Our full production line is basically, uh, it's automated. Mm. It's, there's no hand cutting. Uh -huh. but all the steps in the filleting process yeah. are based on the Japanese way how okay. to produce macro fillets. Uh, scientifically, fish has a good nu nutrition. I totally agree with you. The taste, the fat content, the texture of the fillets, uh, it's probably one of the best fish you can get. Very few people actually know how to prepare. What I'd like to tell you is uh, my cooking is not professional, but uh, <laughs> no. you know, it's a daily life, you know. Cut the fin here, can you see that? And uh, put it on the plate. It's the okay. first time I've seen mayonnaise on, on mackerel fillets actually. Quite interesting. Yeah, it, it's very tasty. Miso paste. It... We actually made uh, mackerel fillets with miso sauce. We made it in our kitchen here in, uh, at the office. The third one is uh, really special. I bought uh, this, you know, bottle of uh, truffle sauce. Oh, it's so nice. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, you know, the... okay, that's it. And the fourth one is uh, uh, minced beef with uh, 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 onion together with uh, tomato sauce. Follow the way of the traditional of a Norwegian, you know, cook. Yeah. So only difference is that I, I brought some examples. Oh, great! Or natural yeah. in tomato produced in Norway. Okay. Okay. So sprinkle tomato like this. I think this would be a very popular dish in Norway. Cool. Very popular. What, what a coincidence. <laughs> Four of a macro, different topping. It, it, oh, it, wow. it looks perfect. Can you see it? Yeah. Skål. Skål. Kampai. Kampai. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's give a round of applause to the chef. We will just do a quick round now to because what I want to discuss now is like the similarities and the differences between the two kitchens. Because I think what we had here was fusion food. And uh, Sakaguchi, you're, you're traveling a lot around the world. And uh, you've also been to the Arctic region. Could you maybe talk a little bit about where do you see any differences or similarities in the, in the, in the seafood industry between the Japan and the Arctic? Uh, well, both uh, Japan and the Arctic, we eat a lot of uh, seafood, of course. And uh, for example, mackerel is a very typical local uh, seafood. But uh, these days, you know, due to the, uh, the climate change, global warming and uh, seawater temperature rise, the catch of mackerel becoming lower and lower, especially this season. Uh, we usually have a mackerel in Japan, around Japan, at my local place uh, a lot, but this year it's very difficult to, to buy it. And so the, the problem, uh, you know, due to the uh, seawater temperature, temperature rise uh, typically affect uh, a lot. But uh, uh, on the other hand, at the northern part, I think uh, I heard, you know, the catch of the mackerel becomes larger and larger. So we can, you know, swap in some sense, but uh, explore uh, how to eat, especially for younger generation, uh, you know, having uh, fish or, or not only mackerel, but uh, seafood is becoming generally slow because it takes long time uh, to cook, to prepare. But that's why, you know, I am developing the way, the new uh, easy recipe, but which can be, you know, uh, bringing very nice, you know, taste. Just like uh, I, I use uh, the macro as a, as a, you know, pizza base. And so put anything left over of the, of the last night and then, and then put cheese and then put them into oven. And then it takes just 10 minutes. 
Oh, so that's, that's the way, the new way I'm, I'm exploring. Ready for young people. Yes. yes. Jens, I, I will quickly want you to maybe talk, because you're importing seafood uh, from yep. Norway to Japan. And are there, are there some parts of the seafood that you're importing that you could not sell in Norway, but that you can sell in Japan? Or, you know, are there things from, from, from Norway that only works in Norway and not, doesn't work in Japan? Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I can tell you uh, uh, two things that uh, go in Japan and don't go in Norway is uh, cold stomach and uh, cold milk, shirako, which is uh, in Norwegian, we, we, don't, we never eat, we never, never have eaten, and I don't think we will eat in the future until the Japanese come and teach us how to eat, same as they, they taught us how to eat the sushi. When I grew up uh, back in Norway, uh, sushi was like uh, non-existent, and now when I go back to Norway, I can see, oh, we can buy sushi in the local supermarket. So I was so shocked a few years ago, totally uh, out of uh, my uh, imagination when I grew up in uh, north of the, in the Arctic. So, so that is the thing. So, so we can, uh, I don't think we will eat uh, shirako and, um, and the cold stomach, but uh, sushi we have really taken into in Norway. So it goes both ways. You know, we, we are exporting and, and also importing food cultures. I want to hear from the two chefs now, and both of you can answer this, the same questions about the processing and the cooking methods. Where Do you see any similarities? I mean, we are geographically very far away from each other, uh, but we, we are both nations that are based on seafood. You know, the Arctic region is based on seafood, and Japan and Korea and so on is based on seafood. Maybe you could elaborate both of you, about the, the processing methods and cooking methods that are similar or different? Pierre, if you could start and then... Um, yeah, I think maybe uh, Chef Sauri would be the best to answer this. She has a good experience working with the produce from the north and with her um, background from Japan. But uh, I agree a lot with the, what Jens said here that um, I think that the, the seafood from the Arctic, from, from Norway, it goes like a hand in glove with the techniques and the passion that the Japanese shows uh, when cooking. So I think that there's a, yeah, I don't know, in the later years we have kind of uh, imported a lot of the techniques and the dishes from the Asian countries at the same time as we are exporting our beautiful seafood to uh, the Asian countries. So it's like a, a kind of a food cultural exchange of produce and techniques the other way. Yeah. And Saori, any similarities or differences you see in the cooking methods and so on? Yeah, I think uh, it used to be more raw culture, like a ro more raw cooking uh, in a way uh, compared to how people cook in Norway. And uh, I am a uh, chef based in Sweden, but uh, uh, as Jan said, uh, like it's more importing and exporting of the sorry, <laughs> exporting of their uh, ideas, and it's getting more uh, similarity in cooking ways, and a lot of differences in seasonings. For example, like uh, I was thinking, what can be typical example? But for example, sabani. Uh, like a mackerel simmered in miso and so on that you, you barely, barely see it in Nordic countries yet, but uh, uh, it's more like uh, simply maybe cooked or seasoned, uh, like uh, uh, baked in the oven like uh, Hidesan did. Um, yeah, and also I came up to one thing that was very interesting is like when it comes to meat, for example, like Japanese meat is much more fatter, mm -hmm. like uh, as you, it's known as wagyu, and uh, it's more like red meat in. But when it comes to mackerel, uh, as you once said, it's a wonderful fat, and it's almost when you touch it, you can feel like fat on your finger and melting, like wonderful. Uh, so it's like a little bit the other way around that uh, this kind of uh, material or ingredients came to Japan and the people enjoying it. Thank you very much. And Johan, before we move to, to the salmon, could you maybe just explain just briefly about how is the trend been for mackerel? Like, uh, what does the Norwegian Seafood Council see for, uh, are, they no, are the Japanese eating more or less mackerel or are there potential for more using some of Sakaguchi's recipes maybe? 
Yeah, the Sakaguchi san, I didn't know that you were that master chef. So this is, uh, that was good. And I think there was a potential, <laughs> there's definitely a potential for more mac uh, for eating more mackerel in Norway. Because the thing with the mackerel is that in Norway, we use it, as uh, Mrs. Sperry said, more in the canned. It's tomatoes and uh, mackerel in a can. It is actually the Japanese that went to Norway and discovered our mackerel and brought it to Japan. It was not the Norwegians who was bringing it to Japan. It was the, Norwegian, the Japanese people coming to Norway, discovering our mackerel and bringing it back because they saw the quality of it. So every seasoning, catching season of the mackerel, there are approximately 30 Japanese inspectors inspecting all mackerel landed in Norway and they make sure they pick only the best, bringing it back to Japan. So I think there is a big potential for more mackerel. We see it. We are growing our sales of mackerel to, to Japan. Uh, the trend is as, uh, you, have, you struggle with the catches both in Japan and in Korea. And we see that we are more and more compensating that loss in own catches with you know, import on which mackerel. Perfect. So for the next video, Johan, you will uh, just briefly introduce the salmon. You know, what uh, the role of the salmon. The role of the salmon is very important in Norway. It's the, by far two-thirds of all, all our export value out of Norway is salmon. So salmon is important. Japan is very important it, historically and also in terms of image. The Japanese eat our salmon in the sushi way, and the Norwegians are now bringing the Japanese sushi way of eating salmon back to Europe. One of the producers, the Norwegian salmon farmers, he's producing 70 million sushi pieces with salmon in Europe every year. So he's really bringing the Japanese story back to, to Europe. The difference between Japan and Korea, you would say maybe there is no difference. Yes, there is. In Japan, we are flying it in mainly in fillets. So because of the transport logistics, it's mainly 70, 80% of the salmon coming in is fillets. So you just cut it and prepare it and out in the stores or in the restaurants. In Korea, it's the big fish. It's the six kilo plus fish they're buying. They want to have it even bigger sizes and even more chubby and fatty. So uh, in terms of that, there are differences between the two markets. And that's a very important point because the next video is a sponsor from KMI, Korean Maritime Institute, and it's Korean cooking. And it's also to show we were not only showcasing Japanese cooking, it's also Korean cooking, which is very different, but also using seafood products from the Arctic region. So let's please put on the, the, the salmon video of Korean cooking. Thank you. Maybe the internet is not very good. <laughs> okay, I will repeat that. I know that the Arctic is well known for its severe cold weather and it is hard to go. And so I wish that one day I could go to the Arctic. I have traveled to Norway, but I've never been to the Arctic region. So I don't, I don't know much about the Arctic other than when I, what I saw on TV. If possible, I would like to cook with fresh local seafood from the Arctic someday. I am Omji Kim, I am director of Northern Polar Regions Research Division of Korea Maritime Institute. Hi, and uh, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Pri Taylor, I have my colleague Jason with me here. What's your philosophy uh, as a chef? My philosophy as a chef is to make delicious dishes with fresh in ingredients and give health, pleasure and happiness to many people. In other words, I want to do my best in a given job honestly and live, li uh, live life at full pace. Oh, it is wow. Korean style of sauce. Okay, Chef Gu, we're curious, what is Korean food to you? Korean dishes are slow, healthy, and beautiful. The Norwegian salmon dish I'm going to demonstrate is a spicy, sweet, and addictive dish with Korean sauce that can relieve our stress. So, so. He, he will put the sauce so, so to salmon. Yeah, I wish we could be there and taste. <laughs> yeah. It looks so good. Uh, Chef Gu, what do you think Korean chefs are looking for when they're cooking with salmon? Korean chefs will find fresh and a little less expensive salmon 
And also, I wish the distribution process was shorter than now. In fact, fresh salmon is not an affordable ingredient that can be easily found in Korean market. And how do you think we can get the, the Korean people to eat more seafood from Norway? For consumption growth of salmon in Korea, uh, the, we need to develop the new menu. Uh, we uh, smoked salmon is familiar with Korea in in Korea in Korea, but you can see you can steam salmon and eat it. Uh, they will be lead to more consumption. <laughs> it smells. Yeah, it smells very delicious. Korea no more. It's too far from Korea to Norway. <laughs> Thank you very much for for this. And Johan, I want to start with you now, and then we move down. I want to talk about the Arctic, the concept of the Arctic region as when it comes to branding and also understanding in, in Asia, you know, in the cooking, do people, do people see a difference? And do people, like, is, can you add a premium to the product if you call it Arctic? So, Johan, please. I, uh, well, we're playing on the Arctic in uh, our communication also. The cold, the, the mountains with the snow, the cold, clear waters of Norway. And uh, the more north we get, the more we find all the images that we are playing on also in our communication. It is the cold, it is the coldness that makes the delicious taste of our products. The slow growing fish, the slow growing, well, everything we make in Norway in the northern part takes longer time. And by that, you get it more fatty, you made a better taste on it. So we promote it, definitely. And, and, and it, this is different to what you find in other markets, like in Japan. They immediately, when they are asked about what associations they have to Norway, it is the cold, it is the cold, rough nature that is not made for humans, but is more made for our seafood. So it's very strong in Japan, this image of our nature, and also in Korea. Both countries have our nature as the main assets. So being north of the Arctic, uh, we find products of salmon in both in Japan and in Korea that are heavily promoting only that it's farmed north of the Arctic Circle just to show that it's even slower growth and even more tasty. Thank you. And Chef Sori, I mean, you, you worked in, in, in Sweden, another Arctic state. And do, 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 you, have a, do you think the, the Japanese uh, customers or restaurant, restaurant visitors, do they have an understanding of the difference between Nordic and Arctic? And is it important in the cooking? Maybe you could elaborate a little bit. I think a lot of the uh, focus uh, for chefs and consumer is uh, uh, qualities. And uh, as your one presented, it's uh, like a really good quality in Norwegian fishes that are coming. And also when it comes to salmon, um, you sort of see people know about, uh, okay, salmon from Norway. Of course, it's not only from Norway, but the majority. So there is uh, certainly like branding and an image of uh, uh, Norwegian seafood in Japan. And also its strength is uh, sustainability and a lot of uh, um, uh, conscious thought about the uh, uh, environment, that strength of the uh, seafood from Norway, I think. So, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, very important that uh, we sort of spread that and then the people, uh, it's more words, ethical and sustainable uh, spreading in Japanese community as well. And then uh, it's a good timing to spread the, the background of the product so people actually use it and they know why we are using it. Thank you. And Pierre, you work for an organization called Arctic Mat, so it's literally in the name Arctic Food. But but is Arctic Food unique in Norway, you think? Or, or do people just see no Norway as the south of Norway? Uh, yeah, for the, for the decade uh, that we've been working with promoting food from the region, it became more and more clear to me that uh, when we have guest chefs, like we're lucky to have Saori a couple of times visiting us, but we have chefs from all over the world, from Brazil and uh, 
uh, yeah, all over the world, they come and, and visit our uh, our region, and I can see that there's a huge appreciation in the way that we produce the food, uh, the quality and the texture of the food, but also uh, maybe the most important thing is the history around the food, uh, the pureness of the nature and the people that produces the food. It's, uh, it's done with uh, pride and modesty. We're not like uh, good at bragging about what we have, but you can taste it and you can uh, feel it in the produce. So that's become uh, like a, mom a eureka moment for me because we kind of, yeah, we have the fish, we eat it every day and we have the, the good quality meat. So for us, it's like our uh, daily life. But when we have people from other countries visiting, we actually get to acknowledge that what we have here is quite unique. So that is uh, what has been driven me especially uh, to, to focus more on promoting the, um, the foods from the region to, especially in, in an international market. Yeah, thank you. And Jens, are you, are you using the Arcticness in your branding, the clear waters, the northern lights, the open spaces? Is that a part of your branding when you're exporting your card, for example? Of course. And why? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, we, we use the, uh, the, the seafood from Norway brand, which is very well known. And uh, I think when it comes from the Arctic itself, we don't really talk so much about that. And uh, I sense that in, in this case, Iceland or Norway is kind of a similarities in, in the Japanese market. The, the cold and, and um, the coldness and the, the, the clear and the, and the pure water and the, the management of the fish stock is also important for those who are interested in, in the sustainability. Of course, these two nations are the, the largest one, but uh, f for me, I, I, I brand it as the seafood from Norway. As you know here from Johan, we, we, we spent like uh, 10 years to promote uh, salmon in Norway. And then finally, the Japanese gave in and started eating salmon sushi after many, uh, and a few years ago, I think six or seven years ago, salmon was actually in, uh, approved by the Japanese Sushi Association, which is a big milestone. So, so the next uh, kind of a interesting uh, salmon, sorry, uh, sushi, maybe cod sushi from farmed cod, which is kind of a, we are actually working on now to, to, to start to do a small test uh, import. So uh, listen after the cod sushi shortly. Thank you. Interesting. And Dr. Sakaguchi, I want to get back to something you mentioned that they also mentioned the conversation here is that young people are eating less and less seafood. And I mean, we see the same in Japan, we see the same in Korea, that beef is overtaking seafood. Why do you think this is? And like, what, I mean, what, how can we change this trend? Because we know seafood is, is very healthy. So, so, and we know there's a long history of culture, both in the Arctic region and in, in the Asian region for seafood. How can we change this? And why do you think we see this trend? Well, basically, it, uh, it, it has a long history. You know, before we Japanese uh, starting uh, eating uh, beef or uh, pork meat, uh, we had a very long history, more than 1,000 years uh, history to have uh, seafood. But uh, just in last maybe 80 years, uh, it has been changed. And now, you know, the most of the fast food uh, is based on hamburger and uh, these things, you know, based on uh, uh, meat, uh, especially uh, beef, right? And uh, of course, some seafood uh, filet of fish uh, burger exist, but uh, still the majority is based on, the, for the fast food, it's based on, on, on beef. But uh, what I'm trying to change is, uh, you know, the seafood fast foods, not just in you know, a fried one, but uh, you know, the lot of lots of variety of uh, you know, taste must be there. And uh, that's why it's my, my dream is after retirement from uh, Saska Peace Foundation, I would like to start a small restaurant uh, to, 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 to introduce you know, nice, easy you know, uh, cooking uh, seafood, for, especially for young. And because you know, as uh, I mentioned in, in the video, scientifically, you know, Seafood, especially the bluefish like uh, like uh, mackerel and uh, tuna and uh, all those things, are very very you know nutritious and uh, it makes some uh, a very smooth blood flow. It has been proved medically, and uh, that's why I would like to get back the culture of uh, seafood for Japanese, not only Japanese and for all you know Asian all over the world. Yeah, that's my dream. 
we are looking forward to visit the restaurant when it, uh, when it opens. Um, we have two more videos, and the next one is about the King Crab. Uh, and Pierre, if you could just give us the, the quick introduction to the Norwegian King Crab. Yeah, uh, Norwegian King Crab is a pretty amazing product. It uh, has a really unique taste, and it's highly valued. Um, I was lucky, actually, uh, for this video, I'm, we're I mean, talking to Annabelle from Norwegian Shores, which is a company that is actually based, uh, yeah, like a 10-minute drive from my house. Uh, they have a lot of products, uh, king crab, scallops, sea urchins, uh, langoustines, and they actually get the, the king crab they get from the northernmost part of Norway in Finnmark. And then they transport it to, to the loco location nearby where I live, and they have, keep them alive in tanks. So they ship both uh, uh, frozen king crab, but also uh, a live king crab to, uh, to all over the world. Okay. Let's see the video with the king crab. Please put on the video. Hello, my name is David. Uh, I'm a chef and just recently had the opportunity to come out to Japan. My name is Annabelle and I'm originally from South Korea. I fell in love with uh, Norwegian seafood. <laughs> Does the Norwegian king crab have a season? Yes, um, we catch a lot of uh, uh, king crab <laughs> during uh, that time, uh, summertime and uh, before the autumn comes. And then uh, we process those crabs because that's where, uh, when uh, they have the most meat. You guys can fish as much as you want, or there's a quota on it, or how, how exactly does it work? Uh, we have a, a very strict uh, quota system in Norway, so we cannot catch uh, as much as we want. If it's invasive, you'd probably want to get rid of it as much as possible. Yeah, but uh, that's not the Norwegian mentality. <laughs> Norwegian king crab is more conscious about the sustainability and, and uh, more conscious about the environmental harm. So we use a small size of a uh, uh, ship and uh, we also care about uh, each value chain and uh, how uh, the raw material is treated. The consumer and also the end market uh, should understand more like why uh, Norwegian king crabs are uh, Good, and uh, why it's a little bit more expensive, but why it's good to consume the Norwegian seafood. Yeah. On my little setup. What's the pairing? So, what goes really well with crab? Um, cheese and butter. <laughs> It's very common in Norway. <laughs> uh, it's very common in Norway because in Norway there are a lot of Norwegians who actually have a neighbor taste the king crab. Can you see it, guys? Okay, so it's a little tartlet with uh, we have a little apple jelly on the bottom, some compressed apples. The crab is just gently seasoned with salt and a bit of horseradish emulsion. Like there are uh, so many different ways to cook, even though it's the same uh, ingredient. So yeah, I, I think it sounds very interesting that uh, you are a British chef, but cooking the Norwegian king crab, but uh, look at in Japan and Tokyo. I've already tried the king crab, it's really good actually, so. Mm. It sounds I'm amazing. I'm gonna have the second one in a second as well. <laughs> Well, we, I mean, not many people know, but a lot of the, I mean, the crab species in, in North Norway is, has been traditional invasive species that came in. There are some traditional and some were invasive species. Uh, so for me, this is about sustainability. And we will also hear about seaweed later, which is also about sustainability. I mean, Iceland is famous for full utilization. We also see the collapse of some fishing uh, industries around the world because of lack of sustainability. So I just want to have a quick conversation about sustainability uh, and how important it is, both for, for chefs, uh, how important is sustainability and using all of the products, using maybe new species, but also if you can charge a premium for sustainability and 
Dr. Sakaguchi, if I can start with you with, with sustainability and the oceans uh, and the Arctic region, maybe you could just elaborate about why is it so important that we, as we're using science, using business, using diplomacy, works on sustainability? Well, uh, sustainability is the word, you know, which is used these days, but, uh, you know, for example, the, the uh, indigenous people have been aware of the sustainability for a long, long time, more than, more than 10,000 years, right? And uh, the reason, for, for example, uh, I have lived in Australia for a long time before, and uh, they have the rule, for example, they catch crab, but just eat one uh, 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 arm, right? And then release it, because they know, you know it, it grows again. But if they catch everything, and then it, it dies, right? And so uh, they have the rule, their own rule, uh, Aboriginal people, uh, they have their own rule for a long, long time. And then sustainability has been automatically uh, you know, uh, uh, preserved. So that's why you know, they didn't face the difficulty for catching uh, crabs and uh, these things. So it, it is basically really important. And uh, we have to be very, very careful about that. Otherwise, you know, these days, we are, we, we are aware of that, but uh, uh, you know, the too much commercialization you know, brings catastrophic situation, but nothing. So uh, we have to be very careful about that, yes. I completely agree. And, and Jens, you mentioned you can charge a premium for, for fresh water and clean air and so on. Is sustainability something you can charge a premium for? I think in the, in the current Japanese market, it's, uh, it's tough to um, charge a premium, but there are some premium restaurants in Tokyo which are willing to pay for the premium, yes. Uh, they are, uh, tend to be a bit high-end, and um, so that it, it is possible. And I just want to comment a bit on uh, Sakuchi on that. The, 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 uh, the, the, the danger of, of overfishing, for example, one story from Norway back in the 1950s, uh, herring was very popular at that time. And with that technology they had from, uh, say, after the Second World War, they have a sonar, they can see almost all the herring in the ocean. And at that time, old uh, style technique, they almost f uh, collapsed the, the fish stock of herring between Norway and Iceland. So like a common stock. Now it took like a 40, 50 years before it came back, but suddenly, oh, my goodness, it's coming back again. So, so it is possible to learn from past mistakes. And for example, this year in 2023 season on the cod in Norway is 20% down the quota. That's the only uh, sort of interstate relationship in Norway, Russia now. We, we cooperate with uh, about the, the fish stock about the cod in the Arctic. So that is the kind of message. It's not so easy to get it out because you know, Japan really like to fish their own stock, you know, and, and have, unfortunately, been a little bit too good at fishing around the Japanese waters. So I think that that type of, of, uh, of strict quota mentality can be sort of transferred from over to Japan successfully. Yeah. And then I think then the, the, the Japanese consumer will be very happy to know that yes, there's a strict regime of uh, sustainability behind the stock they buy in the supermarket. And then they're more happy to buy. That's my, my, my feeling. Thank you. And I would like to hear the two chefs now because there's been this this story about from head to tail when it comes to beef for many years and we have to eat all of the... And, and I also see a trend, especially in the Arctic, using new species like e eating sea urchins in, in maybe North Norway, sea cucumber, they're talking about exporting now, even though there's no tradition of eating sea cucumber in, in the Nordics. How important, like, what trends do you see within the cooking industry, within being more sustainable, using more of the products, using ways to value and so on? Here first. Yeah, first I I just like to say that uh, as a sh human species we have I think both the gift and the curse that we can uh, manipulate the ecosystems, and uh, I think the modern chef has uh, in a, on a general base taken that seriously, and uh, we have come to the conclusion that we also have a voice. Uh, even though most of the chefs are not uh, academic or professors, they also have a voice because they they can affect uh, the general public uh, through their restaurants and and their media channels. They have have they have a, a large uh, audience. 
So it's important that they take that role seriously. And I think that also, uh, I don't know if it's the chef or the audience that have kind of pushed forth this change, but we see that the, the modern guest is more and more demanding, uh, both in traceability of the product they, they order in a restaurant, but also the way that it's cooked, how it's catched, and if there are... Um, uh, yeah, you don't go to a restaurant, a high-end restaurant, and you get a fillet anymore. It's mostly the the so-called, uh, what you say, off-cuts that are being served now. And I think that's a, that's a good uh, thing to do, as long as you just, uh, you don't have to throw away the good parts and just eat the bad parts, which actually also some restaurants almost do. Uh, so you have to use everything. But I think it's important that you, as a chef, you can show that, yeah, we have this, this cut that is a bit tricky to, to cook, but it's possible. So, uh, and we see that uh, happening in, uh, in people's homes as well. And you, Sauri, how do you see the trend in, in cooking when it comes to sustainability and, and seafood? You see wild wa worldwide uh, uh, right now, a lot of chefs uh, uh, trying to introduce the products, something that they are proud of using, uh, which is sustainable mostly. Uh, but also, as Paul said, it's important that how you use it uh, not only uh, taking the products that is uh, responsible and sustainable, but also using the whole thing and not wasting it. And uh, also chef owns really uh, big responsibility, I think, uh, in a way, so uh, because we are serving food to guests and uh, where we can also provide the information about uh, like what sort of ingredients we are using. Uh, that means naturally chefs need to know what we are using uh, as well. Uh, we talked about a little bit uh, this morning, or me and Par, but uh, uh, some things like a plastic package, for example, in Japan is very visible, uh, and you can tell directly what is uh, not sustainable. It, it's this quantity of using it, uh, this package is such an animal. It's quite easy to see and visible. But uh, when it comes to choosing products and in ingredients, like uh, there is a two fillet of, for example, uh, mackerel or salmon, and it's hard to uh, tell people what is uh, the uh, background of the ingredients. So I think it's very important to uh, provide much more information. So there is a yeah, more people get more conscious about it. And Johan, I will not. I will skip you actually now because we're running out of time, and I'm sure you have a lot to say about sustainability. So, for the sake of time, Pierre, if you would just quickly introduce what is butaga and what is uh, the role of seaweed in the Norwegian cuisine, and then we'll see the video and we'll do a final round. So, Johan, you will have the chance. Yeah, for the next video, we're having uh, Tamara from Lofoten Seaweed, which is a company in Lofoten that harvests seaweed. And then we have Lia uh, from Butarga Burale in, uh, in Troms. And then we have uh, Chef Sauri joining us also in the video. So, um, I mean, seaweed hasn't been traditionally used much in, uh, in Norwegian cuisine. It's a pretty new uh, ingredient, but it's popping up uh, everywhere now. Uh, they're harvesting seaweed as never before, and it's being more used to food for human consumption now than, than ever before. Uh, Butarga, that's, uh, we usually have it as a mullet row. Uh, which is salted and dried, very common in the Italian kitchen, for example. But this time we were using codro, and that sustainability, this is made by uh, salt and wind. That's yeah. the main ingredients. Let's see the next video, and then we will have the final round of comments. Please put on the video. Thank you. Hi, Tamara and Leah. This is Sauri. I'm a, a freelance chef. I've got the uh, big magic box from both of you. <laughs> Hi, Sauri. This is Leah from Botarga Boreale. We are a seafood company based in Tromso. I'm Tamara, one of the co-founders of Lofoten Seaweed. So my mum is Japanese and I've grown up eating seaweed all my life. We have seaweed types such as um, the winged kelp, which is very much like the Japanese wakame, or weed, which is very much like the Japanese 
uh, from birds. There is also one type of seaweed, um, which is we call truffle seaweed. Botarga, the classical one, which is the first product we came out with. My curiosity is a bit also what Tamara said, you know, when compared to karasumi or like mallet botarga. What was your impression? Uh, my impression was that it's very clean flavor. I was quite surprised and also I tasted it with my parents and they were also liked it so much. What I'm trying to do today with it is actually tempura. Oh, yes. I never thought of that. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. Would you be able to take a picture of the... Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> Are we okay so far? Yeah. <laughs> While I'm waiting, I'm gonna shave a little bit of this. Ta -da! Oh. Uh, yes. <laughs> wow. So here's the next dish. This time I cooked the whole thing like this. All, I think the flavor just stayed there together with this lightly saltiness. The other half of the company, Angelita, who I told you about earlier, so she was um, just trying to have a peek at what you were doing, Saori. Yes. I'm so Hello. curious. <laughs> Thank you for wonderful products. So this is a third dish. This is completely out of anything I could have think of. So it's amazing to see. That was great to see. We have three minutes left, so I would like to just round up this panel with having a short comment from everyone about this whole connections between the Arctic and Asia with around food. So, Johan, short comment from you. A short comment is that uh, life uh, buying uh, seafood as a end consumer, it's complicated to make the right choices. There are so many varieties and considerations you have to take into account. So the easiest way for any consumer is just to look for the Norwegian origin. Then you know that it's sustainable and you know that the product normally tastes very, very good. Says Johan from the Norwegian Seafood Council. So uh, full disclosure. And Sori? Yes, uh, I got involved in this project this time. And uh, what I learned is like it's all about information. Uh, so like you know, everything that uh, this panelist said today is also very important, but also it's very important that uh, these information uh, are information is easy to reach for uh, people that are actually consuming. So, and I also enjoyed so much uh, exchanging the ideas and uh, getting knowledge of the products this time. Thank you, Pierre. I just want to say, in general, I think food is a perfect tool for, uh, I mean, making cultural exchange and maybe also diplomatic uh, exchanges. Yeah. And Jens? Yeah, I think the uh, seafood industry is uh, very uh, interesting and there's a good uh, cooperation possibility between <coughs> Japan and the Arctic countries. So uh, I uh, really appreciate to be uh, part of that. Thank you very much. And the future restaurant owner of a seafood restaurant in Tokyo, uh, Dr. Sakaguchi, any final comments about the role of food in Asia and the Arctic and how we can collaborate? Well, uh, to stop global warming, to stop ice melting in the Arctic and the third pole we discussed, let's have seaweed because the you know, blue uh, carbon intakes you know the carbon di dioxide from the air and it's a most you know uh, incredible uh, way to stop uh, and also carbon neutralization so let's eat seaweed and i and i think actually i mean asia can be a great inspiration for all of us living in the arctic region how to eat seaweed and how to eat more seaweed uh, and i think it's a very good way to conclude because it's the most sustainable uh, clean way to to eat food as well Thank you so much to the panel. Uh, please give them a round of applause and then we'll put on the blooper video.